Good morning, Grace Church. You guys will stand. We're going to get our worship started this morning. How you guys doing this morning? Amen. It's awesome to hear. We're going to open with the word of prayer just to thank God and have him bless our service this morning. Father, we just come before you, Lord. First, Lord, we just want to come, Lord, just emptying ourselves, Father. Just anything we're thinking of, anything we're worried about, Father, we want to make room, Father, because when a cup is too filled... There's no room to pour anything into it. So we empty ourselves this morning, Father, to allow your presence to be poured out within us, Father, to allow knowledge to be received this morning, to make some room in our hearts and our minds, Father. Father, we ask for forgiveness of our sins, Father. We want to come to you this morning as pure and clean vessels, Father. Just thanking you, giving you all the glory for the breath of life that we took this morning when we woke up, Father. And we praise your name, Father. We just give our service to you. We ask, Lord, that you would just magnify and, and glorify just everything about the words preached today. Let them hit really deep within our hearts and our minds, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh 
Your glory shines. You teach the sun when to bring a new day. Creation sings. God, you reign. God, you reign. God, you
it one more time. God, you reign. Let's sing your raise your voices. God, you reign. Yeah. 
He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne, the four living beings, and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represented the sevenfold spirit of God and sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a heart and they, be, they had each held gold bowls filled with incense which are prayers to God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become the kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders. And they sing in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the Lamb. And all God's people in this place said, Amen. And all of God's people say, Hallelujah. And all of God's people say, Amen. And all of God's people say, Hallelujah. Lord, you are worthy to be praised. Jesus Christ, you shed your blood on the cross for each one of us. You're the way, you're the truth, and you're the life. We lift up the name of Jesus this morning. The Spirit, Jesus, when he opened the scroll in Luke chapter 4, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring the gospel, to bring the good news to the brokenhearted. That same Spirit lives in you if you're a believer. He rests and lives and abides in you. The situation is not hopeless. We serve an incredible God. We serve a living God. He's not dead. That's why the angels said, what are you doing? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's alive. He's risen. And in the name of Jesus Christ, lay your hand on your body, or if you need to pray for someone, who, something you're going through, in the name of Jesus Christ, we speak deliverance. We speak wholeness to those parts of the body that are sick. The yoke and the spirit and the power of God is the one that heals. And he does it because he loves you. Thank you, Lord, for releasing your spirit and your power into these situations. In the name of Jesus, we pray for our sister Nancy. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, Manifesting your power in her body right now. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Choose your focus. Choose your focus. Choose your focus. 
fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he bore the shame for you and I. Choose your focus. Set your eyes on Jesus. Right now, close your eyes and focus on Jesus. He is the one that healeth thee. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He began your book, he wrote your book, and he's going to end it. And as long as you're living here on this earth, we need to be about our Father's business. Speak vision and purpose into these people, Father. The Bible says, seek and you will find. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. these three things, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You're loved by the God that who created this entire universe. If he knows every single hair on your head, oh my goodness, how much more? If we were enemies of God, how much more now? that we've been saved by His grace, does He love you? He loves you. And He's for you. And if God be for us, who, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? You and God are the majority. God is with you. Understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will bring it to pass. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on it. Don't trust your own understanding. Acknowledge God. He'll give you direction. He'll give you guidance. In Jesus' name. We declare that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor John. Hallelujah. attitude of worship. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Isn't it good to be in the presence of the Lord? It's good to be in the house of God. Amen. Amen. It's good. Turn to somebody and say, it's good. Turn to somebody else and say, it's going to get better. Hallelujah. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. It's going to get gooder and gooder and gooder. Amen. Some of you, some of you got to, you, you just got to, you just got to say it by faith. It's getting better. It's getting better. I walk by faith and not by sight. I walk by faith and not by sight. It's getting better. It's 
getting better. I'm walking healed. I'm not sick anymore. Glory to God. Things are changing. It's getting better. You believe that, say, yes, it's getting better. Raise it up. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus who died on that cross, Lord God, who was beaten, whooped for us, Lord God. But, Father, we know that on the third day you raised him from the grave, Lord God. So the word says that by his stripes we are healed. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we do this in remembrance of all you've done for us. In the mighty name of Jesus, go ahead and partake. And the blood. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the precious blood, Father God, that was shed for us, Lord God cleansed us, washed us, made us snow, Lord God. Brought us out of our own shame, Lord God, everything from our past, Lord God. And you made us as if we've never sinned before, Lord God. So we are grateful, Lord God, for your goodness, your mercy, Lord God. And we thank you for it, and we do this in the remembrance of Jesus. Go ahead. Amen, amen. Well, turn around, greet someone, let him know, I told you it was getting better. Amen. God bless everyone and welcome. On behalf of all the pastors, we want to say welcome to everyone. Amen. Amen. Do we have any first-time visitors here this morning? We do. Yes, we do. And we want to welcome you. Amen. If you're looking for a church, you just found one. Amen. We're so glad to have you here. I've got Quite a few announcements this morning, so I want to let you know. Does everyone have their calendars? If you don't, we always have some up in the front that you can pick one up up in the front in the information table there or desk. Uh, first of all, I want to start off by saying that the cafe is having a sale today. Green chicken enchiladas, casserole with rice, beans, and a drink for $7. Amen. So if you're hungry today, just stop by the cafe. Always support the cafe. Remember, we use the funds for different purposes. So if you're hungry and you want some green chicken enchiladas, see Coco. She always does a great job with that. Amen? Amen. Amen. So first of all, we've got on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, we have our men's uh, study at 7 p.m., Pastor Andrew. And then we also have young adults at 7 p.m. here at the church in the youth building. Come on, youth. Do we have any youth in the house? Young adults, young adults. Amen. And then Sister Patty has her group 
every Thursday as well, and that's held at her um, facility. You go to the gate, and they direct you to where it's, it, it will be held, and they direct you where it's at, okay? And then we also have this Saturday coming up at 9 o'clock, Sisterhood. <laughs> Woo! Sisterhood is a, a good group. It's made out of many different churches. Many women from different churches come over here with uh, uh, Sister Maggie and her sister, and they give a great, great study. They have praise and worship. They have food. They have different women from different locations of different churches, and they come together. They worship God, and they give the word. And it's a great group to go to, amen. So if you want to attend that, that's at 9 o'clock this coming Saturday. And then also I want to let you know that on the 24th, mark this down for anyone that hasn't attended a pizza with the pastors, that's a partnership. If you haven't and you're not a member of the church yet, we're inviting you to have pizza with the pastors. And what this is, it's pretty much you are partnering with the pastor saying, you know, I, I, I'm connecting with the vision of the church. When you connect with the vision of the church, anything that takes place in this church and you, you are a part of, the blessings that take place here are blessings to you as well with your families. You know, if anything happens as far as your prayers for your family, we do uh, weddings for your family, we do funerals. I mean, we, we, the, the pastors are available. You always want to be partnered up with a church. You don't ever want to be alone. You want to partner with someone. And Grace Church is an awesome place to partner with. Amen? Come on, if you're going to clap, clap. Amen. And that's on the 24th. And then also, the last one here we have on the 31st, uh, we're going to be having the children and the second service. They're going to have an Easter hunt in the back for second service. And we're asking that you bring eggs filled with candy. We don't want empty eggs, but Sister Maria, who is the director, she is requesting that, you know, if you can, bring eggs that are filled, those little plastic eggs, fill them with candy, fill them with money, fill them with whatever that you need to fill them with, but don't bring them empty so that the kids can have an Easter hunt out in the back. <laughs> and then um, also, we're also going to have, we normally have a picnic, but this year's not going to be a picnic. We're going to sit up in the front. We are putting out tables and canopies. And for those that can stay, you can stay around fellowship. But those that can't, grab your hot dog, grab a pop, cotton candy, uh, grab whatever we're going to have up in the front, and you can take it with you. That way you're partaking of what's taking place here at the church as well because sometimes you can't stay like me. We go with our families, and that way I can take a hot dog home too. <laughs> so for those that can't stay, amen? amen. Say Amen. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and call Pastor John for tithes and offering. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to go ahead and receive the offering. So anyone that needs an envelope, raise your hands. The ushers will hand you an envelope. Amen. This church, you guys come prepared. Amen. You guys are ready. Or you do it online. There's many ways you guys can give. And if you don't know, you can do it online, mobile, in person. Amen. Or if you want to do it over the mail, it'll get here. Amen. As long as it gets here. Glory to God. But there's a lot of good things happening here at Grace Church. And I'm so glad that you're a part of it on behalf of Pastor Manuel. We're so thankful for your continual giving. It is a blessing that there's always, you know, there's always enough in the house of God to do what God has called him to do. Amen. Pastor Manuel has a vision that God has placed in his heart and you know, you're, you're part of it. You're part of it. What you see here, I know, because, you know, I've known Pastor Manuel for many, many years, since the 1990s, oh my God. And, um, and he's always had a vision. He always spoke about these things. I remember when I was pastoring a church, I would come and meet with Pastor Manuel, and he would, he would show me already 
what God was showing him. He just kept telling me, I don't know where it's going to be, but I know it's going to be. And this is what he was showing me. You know, this is what he was showing me at that time when they were still meeting at a school, when we were meeting at a school. And how many of you know, sometimes you can get discouraged and thinking it's never going to happen. But God is faithful. Amen. You stay faithful, God stays faithful. Amen. God will always meet your need. Don't give up because your answer could be right around the corner. Amen. Right? When you're about to give up, the answer was right there. Amen. So let's not give up. Let's not give in. There's plenty of things to do. Jesus is coming back, and we're going to be ready. Amen. So raise up your offering to the Lord. Believe with us for the needs of the church and also believe for your home. So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God. We give you all glory and honor, Lord, that you are the God that supplies all our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that the needs of the church are met, Lord God, so that we can continue to preach the gospel, Father. And I thank you for each and individual person here, Lord, as they give, you provide their needs, Lord God. So we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen, amen. amen. God bless you as you give. Amen. Amen. All right. Had to make sure the AC was set to like 72. <laughs> if you get cold, sorry. <laughs> oh. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Our hearts are open and our minds are alert to receive what you have for us this morning. Thank you, Lord, that the Spirit of God always moves. The Spirit of God and the Word of God always make an impact. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not you, Lord, that's the variable, it's us. So we focus, we're attentive, and we're ready to hear the Word of the Lord this morning in Jesus' name. The reason why I was impressed to share Revelation chapter 5 with you this morning is because <clears throat> it's important to remind ourselves of what's forthcoming. You shouldn't be scared to read Revelation. It's a book of triumph, of victory. So, I hope you were encouraged because the Word of God is powerful and it's sharper, Hebrews 4 says, than any two-edged sword. This morning, this is a continuation from last week of the series, it's a two-part series, called Calling Men to Lead. Calling Men to Lead. And last week, I shared with you two areas that I believe are critical for us as husbands and fathers to lead. And the first one was, we must lead in modeling a relationship with God. You, fathers and husbands, I'm talking to you. We have to model that first. Remember that adage that says, don't do as I do, just do as I say? That doesn't hold water. We have to model that. Our wives and our children have to see that in us. Have to see it in us. And then number two, we have a responsibility to shape our family's worldview. <clears throat> the one area that you have tremendous influence over is your family. Yes. Tremendous influence. Especially those of you with young children. How many know that young children are impressionable? They repeat what they hear. And they model what they see. We can have a tremendous impact on our children for the glory of God and the way we train them and the way we teach them and the way we model, again, the life of Christ before our family. I thought 
bring up that first image if you can. <coughs> This father, named Panji, carried his sick baby daughter on his head and walked for two hours through deep floodwaters to reach the nearest hospital in India. <clears throat> his daughter was six months old, and he had to carry his daughter above his head for three miles to get to the nearest health center. The reason why he had to do that, because his daughter's high fever had not <clears throat> gone away. The roads were flooded, and his family actually discouraged him from going. But he walked the three miles through the floodwaters with his baby girl on top of his head. You know, when I saw that image, I thought, that represents, in a very small way, what we're, we're called to do as fathers and husbands, lay our life down for our, for our families. If someone had to walk the three miles, guess who's doing it? You and I. And he did it because he was compelled for love for his child. I would have done the same. Wouldn't you, Dad? Wouldn't you? We would do the same. We would carry our child through five miles if we had to. This is what it's about. It's about laying your life down for your family. Just as Christ laid his life down for you and I, that's what we're called to do, to lay our life down in service for our families. This last point I'm going to make today, we need to lead through challenges. Lead through challenges. Each one of us will face challenges and giants in our lives. And how we respond when we have those adverse and difficult situations will go a long way to determining the outcome of that situation. You can put that next quote. William Frederick Hasley said, There are no great people in this world, only great challenges which ordinary people rise to meet. We are ordinary men and women being used by an extraordinary God. Paul said, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. The base things of this world, that the glory and the excellence might be pointed back to God and not us. 2 Corinthians 4, 6-7 through 7 says, For God, who said, Let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. The, the fragile J. Clark jars represent our body. We're living here on this earth. Our bodies will eventually fail and we're going to be home with the Lord, right? We, this body is not a resurrected body. But he says we have in our bodies this great treasure, and this makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. If God does something through you, God be the glory, right? He chooses to work through us, dads and fathers, to impact our kids, to impact our wife. He chooses to work through us. And at the end of the day, if anything good that comes out of our ministry to our family, it's because God is working through you. And he's for you, and he's not against you. That great power comes from God. The same God that empowered and anointed the early apostles and Paul is the same God living and operating through us. Galatians 2.8 in the Amplified Version says, For he who worked effect effectively for Peter and empowered him in his ministry to the Jews also worked effectively for me and empowered me in my ministry to the Gentiles. That's the same spirit-anointed power that you have. We don't serve a different God from the God that worked through Peter and the God that worked through Paul. It's the same God. 
that operates in each one of us here on this earth. He's working and flowing through you if you allow him, when you surrender to him. Lord, work through me. Flow through me. He'll empower you. And he'll, he's anointed you. So when we lead through challenges, the, one of the, I'm going to kind of break this down a little bit more. And here's the points I want to emphasize today. As we lead through challenges, here's point number one. We need to stay alert. Stay alert. Stay alert during the difficult times that are ahead. 2 Timothy 3.1 says, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will only love themselves and their money. It's going to be about self-absorption. It's going to be all about, and you're going to see this, and you're seeing this now, all about and nobody else. All about me and nobody else. They will only love themselves and their money. They will be boastful, proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Yeah, we could go off on that, but let's not. They will be unloving, unforgiving. They will slander others, have no self-control. They will be cruel, hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. He's giving you a warning. Stay away from people like that. Wow. And notice that nowhere in here do you see the difficulty arising because of external things like gas and food prices, although those have gone up. Verses 2 through 5 talk about difficulties coming because of people. People influenced, not by God, but by the God of this age, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God of this age, which has blinded the hearts and the minds of those who would believe. Blinded. Blinded. People influenced by deceptive teaching and doctrines of demons. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. Wow. How do, they, how do you turn from the true faith? You begin to follow deceptive teaching and practices. Doctrines, doctrine just means teaching of demons. Oh my. Oh my. Doctrines of demons, the deception, you see the deception that Paul's pointing out here? That is the enemy's biggest tactic is deception. Infiltrating our society, our culture with lies. It's like Paul said, like, it's like high sounding nonsense. He said, don't be bewitched or deceived. Don't be cheated. I talked about that verse, it's in Colossians. Wow. Wow. Deceptive teaching and doctrine of demons means you and I must stay alert. Staying alert means staying in your relationship with God and staying really, really, really close to this, the Word of God. Don't deviate from the Word of God. The farther I move away from the Word of God, that drift takes place. Hebrews 2 talks about lest we drift away. The deception doesn't happen like that. It happens slowly. Really slowly. It's a nudge here. It's a compromise here. It's a step here. And then before you know it, you're deceived. And then you're manifesting what Isaiah chapter 5 says. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil then you're calling evil good when you're deceived. And there's a lot of people calling good evil. They're calling marriage between a man and a woman evil. The standard is God's word. This, you ha this is what you have to reconcile fathers and husbands. If this is not the standard then you will fall prey 
to every wind of doctrine and deceptive spirit. If this is not your standard, this has to be the standard. It has to be. For those of us who call ourselves believers and Christians, that has to be the standard. And I know maybe you were handed a certain belief system. You have to challenge your belief system with the Word of God. Even Paul says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Because he was confronting the hypocrisy of some of these disciples of Jesus, the apostles. These people who said they were trying to mix law with the grace of God. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The Word of God stands true, whether you believe it or not. It is true. This is the one that will probably catch your attention even more. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. <clears throat> so, it's a continuation of, in these last days, there's going to be difficult times. Verse 6, they are the kind who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings, but they're never, never able to understand the truth. These teachers oppose the truth, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith, but they won't get away with it for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Janus and Jambres. Notice these false teachers, these individuals with depraved minds and a counterfeit faith, made their way into people's homes. Wow. How does that happen? People with counterfeit faith, with deceptive teachings and practices. How does that teaching, how does that doctrine make your way into your home? Fathers, husbands, stay alert. You got to be like Nehemiah. Read the book of Nehemiah. When they were rebuilding the temple, they said, with one hand, we're going to have to have a sword to protect ourselves from the enemies. <laughs> and then the other hand, they were building. You're going to have to build your home in a foundation with Christ. And on the other hand, you're going to have to be, be on watch. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, and LT, be on guard, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong. You know what it is? This is about being vigilant. You better be tuned in into what's happening in your house. Be tuned in. Hear the conversations. Have the discussions. Have those very transparent, blunt conversations with wives and children. Be tuned in. Because if you're not tuned in, things will slip by. And then you're going to wonder, how did this happen? Yeah, we have to provide for our home. But if I had to, if I had to choose, I would be like Proverbs where it says, rather to be poor in a house full of love but in a house that's rich and plentiful where there's confusion and there's hatred. If I had to choose, I want my, I want my house, my, my household to be a house that loves God. And I'd rather be poor where we have God and we love each other. My, my, my. First of Thessalonians 5, 6 through 8. Be on your guard. Not asleep like the others. Stay alert. Be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and, drink and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. The context of these verses center around the Lord's return. When it says watch, what are we watching out for? What are we guarding? The deception. The lies. And the only way to know if something is wrong or it's a lie is you have to know the truth. That's why Jesus said, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's the truth that drives out all this false garbage. My. I am going to show that video. You can cue this up. Have it, has anyone ever seen this video of the guards guarding the to tomb of the unknown soldier. Go ahead and, yeah, put the audio up. Thank you. 
You know, that this uh, video represents beautifully the calling of God for us fathers to never leave your post, to be on watch, to stay alert at all times, no matter the season. We go through difficult seasons. All of us have been through that. Some of you are going through that now. But no matter what, we will stay our post. We will stay our post. Point number two. We need to be the first responder during challenging times. Be the first responder during challenging times. I said earlier that our response sets the tone for how our family will respond during challenging times. I recall a situation, Caleb must have been in the second or third grade, and I get a call from the assistant principal that they can't find my son at school. I'm like, what? What do you mean you can't find, my, can't find my son? They can't find him. How do you lose a kid? <laughs> Caleb, early on when he was little, had a very hard time expressing himself, communicating what was in his head. <clears throat> so he's improved so much in that area, but back then he struggled. So... Fear is the first thing that hit me. I'm like, it was about a 30 to 35 minute drive from where I was at from work. So I go in and I start driving. And for those of you who are in the military, law enforcement, you know your training kicks in. And at that moment, I'm like, my, tra- my spiritual training kicked in. And I started praying for my son. Lord, wherever he's at, I don't know what's going on. I have no idea, but I thank you that your spirit and your angels are bringing him back. I don't know where he's at. And she's like, oh, by the way, if we don't find him in the next minute, we're going to call the police. Like they were looking at, they looked in every restroom, like everywhere, in the stalls, couldn't find him. So I'm praying for about 10 minutes and I get a phone call back. Mr. Mendeville, we found him. And you know what? He's like, it was so weird, she said. We didn't find him in a room or anything. He just came around the corner of the school. Like, he was still in the school, but he was coming around the corner. And he, it was a hot day, so he was sweaty, and he, he looked a little dehydrated. I don't know what happened, and I don't care to know what happened. Because I know at that moment, when I prayed, 
the Spirit of God and the angels of God were there to protect them. And that response, it's a, it's a small example of, of something I want to stress to you dads and fathers. When we're presented with some negative news, a bad report, something that's, it's like a crisis, go to back to your spiritual training and say, look, if you're there, if, you're, if you have the opportunity to pray with your wife, let's pray right now. Let's pray. My goodness, we're believers. We serve a great God. Pray. Pray with your spouse if she's there. And if, if she's not able to, you start praying. You start praying. That's why it's called the power of prayer. You start praying for that situation to turn around. Mark chapter 5, verse 21 talks about this situation about the father whose daughter was dying. Little, so his daughter was dying, and <clears throat> I'm going to have to paraphrase here, guys, really quick, because I'm running out of time. So he goes to Jesus and says, hey, my daughter's dying. Will you please come lay your hands on her? On her? And Jesus says, yes, I'm going to go. And then in verse 35, he says, while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter's dead. Your daughter's dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Don't be afraid. Another translation says, just believe. Now, I skipped verses 24 through 34, but those are important because what happened in between when that father said, Lord Jesus, can you please come lay your hands on my daughter so she can live? What happened in between was the account of the woman with the issue of blood. And for years, the Bible said, she sought physicians with no success. So this was like, this was it. And the Bible says, she touched the hem of his garment she felt, she, she, she knew she had been healed. And even Jesus said, I, I feel power like left me. Who touched me? And he went, the women ended up speaking up. It's me, Lord. But guess who saw all that? The dad. Jairus. He saw all that happen. And I believe seeing that miracle encouraged him when he heard the negative report. When that servant said, your daughter's dead, don't bother Jesus. He could have said, you know what, you're right. She's dead. Why bother? The, right? The dad could have said that too. He could have given up, up hope and said, nah, yeah, you're right. It's, but he didn't. He remained quiet. And he let Jesus' words dominate. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Just believe. And then the rest of the story goes, Jesus raised the daughter from the dead. When you're facing a situation where you feel like this is, it's like a crisis situation, it's a difficult situation, go back to the word of God. Trust his word. Don't deviate from this. Yes, seek, you can seek the prayers of other people other believers, your pastors, but you yourself have to believe this is true. God's word is true in spite of what I see. And then point three, there is a time to fight and there's a time to rest. So when we're leading through challenges, there's a time to fight and a time to rest. I know some of you might think fight, that we're believers. We're not called to fight. We are called to fight. But not the way you think. James 4, 7 says this. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That word resist means actively fight against. Notice what comes first, though. Submission to God. Bowing the knee, your relationship with God, because when you're in a battle, you're, you're going to go back to your training. And that training 
is what you've poured into you, yourself with the Word of God. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. That word fight in the Greek has this idea. It means to contend, to struggle with difficulties and dangers antagonistic to the gospel. There is a contention, there is a struggle to stay in faith, to stand your ground, to, to declare, and we're going to get to this later, like Joshua said, we will serve God. We will believe God's word. We're going to press on. It's like Paul said, not that I've arrived, but I press on. I'm going to press on, no matter what I see, no matter what I'm facing. The fight is to stay in faith, to stay rooted and grounded in Christ, to, to know that you're loved by Almighty God. This next quote says this, Since it's so likely that children will meet cruel enemies, let them at least have heard of brave knights and heroic courage. C.S. Lewis. Our children will hear of cruel enemies. Second Timothy 3 says it. They're going to encounter people that are not influenced by God, but they're influenced by the God of this age, the enemy, Satan, that devil himself. Jesus made it clear that the vision statement above the gates of hell is to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10. 10. That is his vision statement for all of God's people and all of, all of humanity. To steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he's selling right there. That's, that's, that's the message coming from the PR team of Satan himself. Steal, kill, destroy. And Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. That's God's vision statement for us. It's not difficult to understand. There's no gray area here. It's really black and white. That's simple. The devil comes to steal, kill, destroy, and Jesus comes to give life and that more abundantly. Simple, right? And our kids need to see, our boys, our daughters need to see brave fathers and husbands taking a stand for what's right and what's true. Ephesians 6, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. What are those strategies? It's deception above everything else. The deception of the enemy For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil and put on your salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Paul used natural examples to paint a very scriptural like picture of what was going on. Remember, the Romans were occupying. They, they were the, the world leader at that time. And the Roman soldier had these pieces on them the armor, the helmet. And Paul related all this armor to the spiritual. We have an incredible defense system. Do you see all that armor that we have? It's an incredible defense system. And we have the most lethal weapon ever. It's the Word of God that can cut through. We're not talking about physical, because he said it's not against flesh and blood. We're not called to hate people, but we are called to destroy arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against God's knowledge. That's what we're called to do, to destroy, not my words, God's words. We're called to destroy those arguments, those worldviews that are anti-Christ and anti-God. You're called to do that, fathers. 
and husbands, you're called to do that. To stand your ground. Stand firm. They are fighting words in that respect. Fight. Fight the good fight of faith. That if you believe, as Pastor Emmanuel has shared repeatedly, that the Lord's return is near, the battle may intensify, and you will have to choose I don't think closet Christianity is going to work anymore. You're going to have to take a stand. More than likely, it's going to be within your family first, and then maybe in your workplace. All right, there's also a time to rest, too. And I want to bring that up because it's, there's, even though um, the Word of God talks about fighting, resisting, there's a time to rest. And I think that's important for us as husbands to realize that, like, you know what? Rest. Like, I've prayed. I've resisted. I've, I am countering this attack on my family. But now I'm going to step back, and I'm going to do Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need, and thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds Anything we can understand, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. There's a time to step back and just rest and say, yeah, God, I know you're working in this situation. I'm at rest. I'm at peace because I know you're working. And those cares and those anxieties, you got to give it over to God. You weren't, made, you weren't meant to carry that load. That's why Peter says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. We're not meant to carry that load. We have to give it over to God. Lord, I give this care over to you. I give this, whatever is going on, that'll cause you to rest. That'll cause you to rest. <laughs> all right. I want you to listen to this. <clears throat> this is a short article about a New York University psychology professor named Paul Vitz. He wrote a book called Faith of the Fatherless. This is the book, Faith of the Fatherless. After he became a Christian, Vitz began to wonder if psychological factors could explain a predisposition to reject God. Vitz studied the childhoods of more than a dozen prominent atheists. He became convinced that their rejection of God is linked directly to a defective relationship with their earthly fathers. Hmm. By defective, Vitz means the father died, the father abused his child, or abandoned him. Here are some examples that he gives in his book. Friedrich Nietzsche, a philosopher famous for saying God is dead, lost his father when he was just four years old. Vitz writes that Nietzsche had a strong intellectually macho reaction against a dead, very Christian father whom he perceived as weak and sickly. The English writer Samuel Butler had a clergyman father who brutally beat him. Vitz writes that Butler revolted against both the beatings and his father's piety. Sigmund Freud despised his weak father, who, whom he claimed was a pervert. Freud placed father, his father's hatred at the center of his psychology, something Vitz believes expressed his unconscious hostility towards his own father. French existentialist Jean-Pierre Sartre lost his father when he was a baby. His mother remarried when Sartre was 12, giving him a stepfather he resented. Not long afterward, Sartre concluded, you know what? God doesn't exist. And then we had the politi political atheist, whose defective relationships with their fathers ultimately affected millions. Joseph Stalin hated his father, who beat him unmercifully. It's not difficult, Vitz writes, to understand why communism, with its explicit rejection of God and uh, all other higher, higher authorities had great appeal for Stalin. Adolf Hitler also received terrible beatings from his father, who died when Adolf was 14. And the father of China's Mao Zedong was a tyrant who taught his son his first appreciation of revolution and rebellion in his own family setting. America's most famous atheist, Madeline Murray O'Hare, despised her father. Her son, William, reports that O'Hare once tried to kill the old man with a butcher knife. After studying these major, major historical rejectors of God, Vitz concludes that we find a weak, dead, or abusive father in every case. Of course, no matter what our family background is, each of us is still ultimately responsible for the decisions we make. That's not an excuse. 
But does it have an impact? You better believe it does. I had the privilege, and I still have the privilege, of being raised, <laughs> of having a father. I had a father and a mother throughout my whole childhood that, sh that showed us that God was going to be number one. That's priceless. It's priceless. It formed, it formed my belief system, going to church. Every, have <laughs> sometimes every Wednesday or Thursday, and then Sunday morning and Sunday night, I was in the pews. And you may think, man, are my children listening? You'll be amazed at the word that God can bring to your children's lives when they're older. That's why the Bible says, train the child when they're young, and when they're old, they won't depart. Because if they go wayward, I tell you what, God can bring that memory of Sunday school. God can bring that memory of you praying, you know, at the house for your food. God can bring that memory back to your, your older children. These, these atheists, they were impacted by fathers who were not present and by their actions. Our, that's why I say what we do, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. As we end, check this out. I don't know if you guys have ever had the opportunity to watch this. Um, oh, you know what? Before that, this, next, this last quote is worth showing. Great ideals and principles do not live from generation to generation just because they're right, nor because they have been carefully legislated. Ideals and principles continue from generation to generation only when they are built into the hearts of children as they grow up. You can legislate morality all you want, but if it's not formed in the heart of a child from early on, it makes it more challenging, not impossible, makes it more challenging as they get older. Those ideals, those principles are formed from a very, very early age. And if your children are older, it's never too late to start modeling what a godly man should talk like and should look like. It's never too late. It's never too late. And God bless you single mothers who have raised sons and daughters. Yeah, God's best is a father and mother. But if, you, if you're in a position where you've, been, you've had to raise these young boys and these young, these young girls, then you got to model it. you got to model it and connect that young man or that young lady with a godly man, whether it's a relative of yours that can speak into their lives in a positive way. Joshua 24, 14, 15. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live? And then that's where we get that famous scripture. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. But look at, look at the backdrop of what Joshua was saying. He's like, your ancestors, your fathers, your father's fathers? Man, talk about rebellion against God. God rescued him from the land of Egypt, brought these plagues upon Egypt. They saw the Red Sea split. You would have thought after seeing that, you're like, man, like, right? All these, all these incredible miracles. But yet, when Moses goes up to the, t uh, up to the mountain, the people are complaining, oh, we don't know what happened to Moses. Let's make some other gods for us. Everybody bring your gold. Oh, out came the golden calf. Isn't that amazing? They see, they see all these miracles, and then, oh, Moses is gone. I don't know what happened to him. And then they begin to worship and praise this golden calf. And that's why, at one point, God said, man, you rebellious and you stiff-necked people, if you're under this age, you're going to continue. The rest of you, you're going to die here in the wilderness. So they wandered for another 40 years, and that generation passed. And so Joshua was saying, don't be like your ancestors, worshiping idols. Don't do that. Choose today whom you're going to serve. Choose. Make a choice. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life. 
And then that's when he says, as for me and my family, we're going to serve God. And notice who he put first, me. For me and my family, we're going to press on with God. And if you're the only one that's serving God in your, your family, you press on. You, got, you might be here, and you might be one of the very few in your family that serves God. You press on. And if you're a single mother, single father, you still make that declaration. As for me and my family, we're going to serve God, right? Now, look what happened. Here's what he did. Look at verse 25 through 27. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day at Shechem, committing them to follow the decrees and regulations of the Lord. Joshua recorded these things in the book of God's instructions. As a reminder of their agreement, he took a huge stone and wrote it beneath the terebinth tree beside the tabernacle of the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, this stone has heard everything the Lord said to us. It will be a witness to testify against you if you go back on your word to God. He was like, oh, okay, you made a commitment. You said we're going to serve God. You see this stone? It's going to serve as a reminder. And when you look at it, if you pass by it, when you talk to your kids about it, it's going to remind you of the covenant you made before God. That as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. In 2011, the creators of this movie, Courageous, part of this movie, you can put that up. Has anyone ever watched this movie? I mean, it was, it's, been, it's been around for a while. 2011, it's the story of four Four fathers and husbands kind of navigating life. Really good movie. Very wholesome movie. Um, and in the movie, towards the end, they make this resolution. That's what it's called. They make this resolution before God, their family, and the church. So you can go ahead and bring it up. I'm a, so I'm, what is it, nine? So I'm like 13, late, 13 years late to the party here. But that's okay. That's okay. We can start right now. So let's go to the top. So here's my invitation to all the fathers here and the husbands here. I invite you to stand. Go ahead and stand if, if you want to. And I want you, as, we, as I go through this, I'm going to read this to you. There's a lot of I will. I'm going to read the I will, and then I'm going to ask you, I agree. I will. You're going to say that. I agree, I will. So let me just read the first part. It just says, I do solemnly resolve before God to take full responsibility for myself, my wife, and my children. Okay? And then here's the rest of the I wills. Here we go. I will love them, protect them, serve them, and teach them the word of God as a spiritual leader of my home. If you agree, say, I agree and I will. I agree. Number two, I will be faithful to my wife to love and honor her and be willing to lay down my life for her as Jesus Christ did for me. If you believe that, say, I agree and I will. Thank you, Lord. Number three, I will bless my children and teach them to love God with all of their hearts, all of their minds, and all of their strength. I will train them to honor authority and live responsibly. I will confront evil, pursue justice, and love mercy. I will pray for others and treat them with kindness, respect, and compassion. I will work diligently to provide for the needs of my family. I will forgive those who have wronged me and reconcile with those I have wronged. I will learn from my mistakes, repent of my sins, and walk with integrity as a man answerable to God. I will seek to honor God, be faithful to his church, obey his word, and do his will. And then finally, I will courageously work with the strength God provides to fulfill this resolution for the rest of my life and for his glory. All the way at the bottom, <clears throat> there's a place for you to sign, for you to date. Can you scroll down? Can you give me one of those right here, Joel, please? 
and for witnesses to sign and date. After church is over, after we dismiss, Grace Church Men's Ministry is providing this. No charge, just we want to give this to you. We won't, the reason why we framed it is because we want it to be like that stone where it's going to serve as a reminder when you look at this of the covenant you made before God. What I would encourage you to do is take it one step further. Have a, have a meal with your family and talk about this and then sign it. It's all it is is a reminder. Put it in a place where it's going to be prominent in your home where you can see it. When I was a high school football player, we used to go out and we would tap the sign above the locker or before the exit. It said, play like a champion. It's like, what is that about? Well, the, the reason why the coach did that, because it galvanized the team. Like, when you go out in the field, play like a champion. You don't have to touch it, but you know what? This can serve as that reminder. When things are difficult, times are tough, let this serve as a reminder of the covenant you made before God and your family. You can do it. I have no doubt. I don't have faith in myself. I have faith in the God that lives in me, though. That's where my trust is at. Yeah, in and of myself, it's impossible, men. It is. But the, we serve an impossible God. We serve an incredible, awesome, loving Father that works through us. That's why we can do it. That's why he's called us to do that. And that's why you can be successful at this because you and I serve the God of the entire universe. Everybody, please stand at this time. I've asked Lalo to come up and sing just the bridge of this song called The Blessing. Has anyone ever heard The Blessing before? Has anyone ever heard that blessing? This is what it says really quickly, because I want you to hear the words before he sings it. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family, keep going, and your children, and their children, and their children. And may his presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you. He's with you. He's with you. And then the final one says, in the morning and the evening, and you're coming and you're going, and you're weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you. Go ahead, Brother Lalo. Come on, declare that over your family. Husbands and fathers, you pray that out. Thank you, Lord, that your presence goes before us. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God lives in you. And He is with you. He's for you. No matter what the situation is, He's for you. He's with you. Be upon you, thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and your children. May His presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you. Oh.
Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we exalt Jesus. Lord, every father, every husband that's here, you have what it takes to lead your family. And if you need the perfect model, look to Jesus. Look to his word. Jesus was the epitome of, of what it means to be a man, a man that loves God, that loved his father. There were times where he was was dispensing grace. He served the disciples' feet. He washed the disciples' feet. And then there was a time where he overturned the money changers because they were trying to make his house a den of thieves and robbers. Hate that which is evil and cling to that which is good, the Bible says. Take a stand. Father, I thank you during the difficult time. Husband, father, take a stand. Be resolute. Be vigilant. Stay alert. And go with the grace and the power and the anointing of God that's already in you. We're not going to fail. And even when you, because you're going to fall short, that's the humility and the grace of God to say, I'm sorry. Look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Father, we, we declare that. We declare over our children that they will grow up to love you, Lord, to serve you. We pray for, some of you have wayward children. They're, they're lost. They, it seems like they're, they're never coming back. Continue to pray for them. Do not give up on your wayward children. Continue to love them. Continue to speak truth into their life. To to continue to declare God's will over their life. Hallelujah. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you. We will never be the same. This, This day will serve as a reminder of the covenant we made, the agreement we made between before God and our family. That is for me and my family, fathers, husbands, let's say that this one last time. As for me and my family, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. In Jesus' name. Pastor John's going to, or we'll be there at the door. If you want one of these, uh, you're going to have to come get one from me. I'm going to be up here absolutely free of charge. I want to give you one of these, but you're going to have to come, come up here, okay?